Hello and welcome to our eighth Psychosocial Wednesday webinar this year. And before I introduce our speaker today, I want to thank the IIP for supporting this initiative in this year, 2023, and the Institute of Freedom for producing this event. And I want to remind you that our next guest uh, is on, uh, it will be Elias Winterton, uh, and the webinar will take place uh, on December the 13th. So our speaker today, with a topic from the suspension to the end of certainties, war as reset, is Stefano Carpani. Stefano is the creator of the Jungianeum. These are initiatives for contemporary analytical psychology and neo-Jungian studies. He is a psychoanalyst trained at the Jung Institute in Zurich and Küsnacht and a sociologist uh, graduated in Cambridge, in Cambridge, yes. Uh, he, he works uh, in private practice in Berlin in three languages, English, Italian, and Spanish. Among the Jungianeum, he is the initiator, initiator of the YouTube uh, interview series, Breakfast at Küsner, which is also has also been published as a book, Lockdown Therapy and War as Reset. He is, as you may uh, remember, obviously one of the uh, initiators of Psychosocial Wednesday, which started in 2020. He creates a number, created a number of books. Uh, the, the, the most recent ones are is an anthology of contemporary classic classics and analytical analytical psychology uh, and individuation and liberty in a globalized world. Stefano, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, if you are on the other side of the world. Before to start, I would like, you're of course, all silence, but I would like to spend a few seconds in silence to acknowledge what is happening around the world, especially in the Middle East, still in Ukraine, and especially in all those areas that don't reach the attention of the media. Thank you. The title <clears throat> of this lecture is Bridging Two Works of Mine, The Suspension of Certainties and uh, soon to be published work on the end of certainties. And the concept that I'm trying to propose uh, of war as reset. Um, Dwelling to the topic of war, it is inconceivable without acknowledging the influence of Homer, of course. So what does war represent in his perspective? According to Rosenthal, who studied Homer in depth, war, it is not a human decision, but a divine one, orchestrated by the gods. War transcends human control, being predetermined, predestined, and escapable. War possesses an intoxicating galore, cursing through us with adrenaline, and even in its ferocity, it can be perceived as noble and remarkably beautiful. War is the arena where men carve their legacy into glory, binding them together in a unique and irreplicable manner. In Homer's work, humans are depicted as primitive beings. 20 centuries wars, as if Homer's description had not been sufficient, with its insistent, almost obsessive focus on the many graphic description of sparing, disemboweling, and the like, veins, arteries, tendons, and vital organs are described in details as countless lives are lost. But 20th century wars made us understand also with the development of TV and cinema, 
as if it was necessary, that war are hell. Of course, it's hell. What else could it be? Although not in Dante Alighieri's way, right? It would be naive not to acknowledge this stark reality, just as it is naive to entertain the notion that there should be no wars. After all, wars have been a recurring feature of human history since time immemorial, and their persistent existence underscores a certain grim realism. Can peace be considered as a pause between wars, as a suspended time? Yet the question persists. What is war? Why is it so challenging to prevent, stop, avoid wars? Why have humans been embroiled in conflict for millennia? When viewed through the lens of the 21st century, what other dimension can we ascribe to war? Is it conceivable to regard war as a reset mechanism? And if so, a reset of what precisely? Jim, James Hillman, one of the most important post-Jungians, claimed in a terrible love for war, quote, there is no practical solution to war because war is not a problem solvable by the practical mind, which is better kept for its conduct than for its avoidance or conclusion. War, Hillman continues, belongs to our soul as an archetypal truth of the cosmos. It is a human work, an inhuman horror, and a love that no other love has been able to overcome. We can open our eyes to this terrible truth and, becoming aware of it, devote all passionate intensity to undermining the enactment of war, strengthened by the courage the culture possesses even in the dark ages to continue to sing as it resists war. We can understand it better, postpone it longer, work gradually, remove it from the support of the hypocritical religion, but the war as such will remain until the gods themselves leave. Simon Weil, upon examining Homer's portrayal of war, highlights that the genuine worth of the Iliad lies in its author capacity for realism and his unsentimental portrayal of a world consumed by chaos. It is this real brutality, sorry, in this realm, brutality is acknowledged matter-of-factly by leaders, soldiers, and even the gods themselves. Drawing from the quotes by Homer and Ilman, it becomes evident that their shared belief is that war is a divine decree, destined to persist until the gods withdraw. In antithesis with this, the perspective of Simon Weil states that war is synonymous with chaos. In accordance with the viewpoint of the French author, I would be more inclined to suggest that chaos ensues when the gods depart. Thus, contrasting the ideas of Homer and Ilman, war may have little to do with gods themselves, but rather with their absence a time when the world loses its spiritual moorings and drifts away from the guidance of spirituality enters war, therefore chaos. Nevertheless, how can Homer's and Ilman's proposal be plausible in a society where God is considered disease following Nietzsche? Or in a society like ours that bypasses the concept of God's death to venture into an era where God simply does not exist, as suggested by Italian writer Primo Levi, who claimed that if Auschwitz exists, God does not. Poet Paul Valéry, reporting on the First World War in his essay titled The Crisis of the Mind, written in 1919, cannot avoid expressing a profound sense of disillusionment, stating that we, quote, modern civilization have learned to recognize that we are mortal like the others. We feel that a civilization is fragile as a life. In a single sentence, he seemed to seal the fate of European civilization, hoping that the power of ideas could find new grounds to take roots, such as in America, for example, or other continents. Doing so, he pronounced a death sentence 
on that continent, Europe, which had been the center of the world up until that moment. In fact, during the 20th century, the United States emerged as the epicenter of the world. Also, Yeats explores similar themes in his poem, also titled The Crisis of the Mind, also published in 1919, serving as a reflective poem that addresses the turmoil and challenges of the time, particularly in the aftermath of World War I. Yeats explores themes related to the state of the world and the human condition in this work. Austrian author Josef Roth, born in Brody, a small town near Lviv in East Galicia, currently Ukraine and formerly one of the many provinces of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, dedicated almost his entire body of work to understanding the reasons behind the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and its consequences. <clears throat> in his most important book, Radetzky March, his character, Skovronek, says, quote, today, not even the emperor takes responsibility for his monarchy. In fact, it seems that even God no longer intended to take responsibility for the world. It used to be simpler before. Everything was secure. Every stone stayed in its place. Life's roads were well paved. Solid roofs rested on the walls of houses. But today, Today, the stones lie haphazardly in the streets, disorderly and dangerously piled up, and the roofs are full of holes letting rain into the houses. Then, in a commanding tone, Skovronek proclaims, quote, everyone must now decide for themselves which path to take and what kind of home to build. Remember, this was written in the early 20th century, right? This book, after First World War. And this concept by Joseph Roth would go on the shape, will go on to shape Western society since the 50s. And the German sociologist Ulrich Beck in 2002 would refer to this phenomenon as the emergence of the homo optionis and individualization. Then Roth add again employing his character, Skovronek. Quote, when my children don't listen to me, I simply try not to lose my dignity. There's nothing else to be done. Sometimes I observe them while they sleep. Their faces then seem completely foreign to me, almost unrecognizable, and I realize that they are strangers, belonging to an era that is yet to come and that I will not know. My children are so small. One is eight years old, the other 10, and their faces are round and rosy when they sleep. Yet in their sleep, those faces have something very cruel about them, as if the cruelty of the looming time of the future is already appearing in their sleep. I do not wish to know them, I do not wish to understand them. For those seeking to understand the rupture between the modern world and what came after, variously referred by the different authors as postmodern, late or second modern, and second late modern, as I proposed in my book, Absolute Freedom, perhaps this is one of the most crucial points, the one underlined by Roth. I propose it is when a man, a father feels, my children don't listen to me, and that he has lost his dignity, that the modern world comes to an end. This, of course, is a reality today also for women. It is this loss of dignity, or as B.B. calls it, integrity, that could lead, quoting another Austrian author, Stefan Zweig, to the end of the world of yesterday as this person knew it, and leading to the continued degrading of it. The World of Yesterday is a book looking at what happened in the Austro-Hungarian Empire and at large at Europe at the beginning of the 20th century, and the end of the world that they all loved and was about modernism.
In fact, as I have underlined, uh, actually, my thesis from Cambridge, um, David Rosen, in the preface to Bibi's book, Integrity in Depth, writes, quote, both integrity and the self are spiritual concept that unify and facilitate transcendence and transformation, end of quote. Furthermore, Bibi underlines that, quote, integrity must be pursued as a desideratum in itself, that it means literally the stage of being untouched. And he concurs with Ruben, Robert, Robert Gerding that, quote, integrity may be defined as psychological and ethical wholeness, sustaining time. Integrity is not a painfully upheld standard so much as a prolonged and focused delight. Hence, I propose that it is the loss of dignity of the father or integrity that compose yet illusory demeanor that marks the entry into a new era, once so well described by Roth and Zweig, characterized by the dismantling of the father as authoritative and its sliding into an authoritarian entity, the questioning of tradition as the sole means to sustain society and its nostalgia, and the recognition of the illusory nature of order as a defense against anarchy. What I'm arguing is that the loss of dignity or integrity leaves a vacuum into which anarchy, which inherently disregards and dismantles the integrity of individuals, will flow. Additionally, such a word as the one depicted by Roth is inhabited exclusively by broken men. Broken men. Women, when they appear, are often portrayed as prostitutes, servants, sick or deceased mothers. I believe that this representation of women is a fundamental and unexplored dimension when it comes to the understanding, the decline and subsequent fall of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire and consequently the outbreak of the First and Second World Wars. The same applies to the Russian and German Empire empires and Europe at large at the beginning of the 20th century. The first 50 years of the 20th century seem to have been, from a psychological perspective, years in which woman or the feminine aspect and the full generative remain in the shadow. Perhaps research that begins with the illness and death of Sissi, Empress Elizabeth, Empress of Austria and Queen of Hungary, could shed light on this aspect. When diversity of perspective is lacking, the balance between the masculine and the family, the feminine, the well-being of both, declines or negatively impact. And the world inevitably loses its equilibrium and falls into decay and war. Stefan Zweig, in his most famous book, titled The World of Yesterday, looks at the beginning of the 20th century and underlines that, quote, the pace of the world had also changed. How many things were happening in just one year now? Discoveries and inventions followed one another, quickly becoming common knowledge because finally, when the collective interest was at stake, nation showed greater solidarity. Consequently, Zweig emphasizes that those who lived during those years could perceive that, quote, around the pride in the rapid succession of triumphs in technology and science, for the first time, a sense of European solidarity was forming, a European national consciousness. Then he continues to highlight how senseless we kept repeating to each other, these borders are now how senseless these borders are now that an aircraft can easily fly over them. How artificial those customs and borders guards seems. How much they contradict the spirit of the times, which unmistakably aspire to unity and universal brotherhood. And one would have today even sisterhood. And then Zwei conclude, in those years, each of us drew energy from the general enthusiasm of the era. 
witnessing our individual self-confidence growing and intensifying along with the collective one. These snapshots serve as a precise glimpse into the transition from the 19th to the, to the 20th century, and it might equally serve as a thoughtfully selected portrayal of the shift from the 20th to the 21st century, what we just witnessed, an era marked by the per per pervasive influence of globalization. As we venture into the 21st century, we surpass what the German sociologist Ulrich Beck aptly termed the risk society, venturing to what Italian sociologists Giacardi and Magatti refer to as the age of shocks, where the reality around us is increasingly shaped by our relationship with technology, algorithm, and as we are plumbered by climatic shocks, political shocks, and the shocks of the mass migration and war, we are left with less opportunity to enter into depth. This era, I propose, grapples with the concept of God, transcending Nietzsche's assertion of his death while affirming his non existence, Primo Levi. Instead, it elevates technology by passing Jung's famous saying that the gods have become our disease to the status of deity. Technology becomes a deity capable of creating, sustaining, and terminating life. For example, the decrease of spirituality is another common dominator at both the turn of 19th to the 20th century and from the 20th to the 21st century. Therefore, we must reflect on what has transpired and how Europe at both times, once characterized by a sense of brotherhood, sisterhood and unity, descended into warfare. Why did Europe transition from what Zweig described as the era of universal confidence to the one that followed, characterized by decline and obscurity? Of course, the historical reasons are clear, and this is not the place to dwell into them. Among the psychosocial causes that led to World War I and World War II, although not limited, we can identify several factors, including an insatiable hunger for power, influence, ego, and financial gains from those in charge, and only laid territory. Two, the dynamic of once fraternal rulers becoming enemies. The aging of prominent figures like Emperor Franz Josef of Austria-Hungary, Wilhelm II of Germany and his ambitions to over, over the future of Europe, and also to compensate a physical inferiority. Five, the armies that had languished in a state of warlessness for more than 70 years, leading to the deterioration of their soldiers' readiness. As Roth elucidated in the Redaxi Marsh, the Austro-Hungarian army beginning in the mid-19th century was in a per perpetual state of anticipation of war. But during this extended period of waiting, suspended time, soldiers immerse themselves in decreasing training, increasing gambling, prostitution, corruption, drunkenness, and experience a loss of honor. Six, while the concept of Austria Felix in our collective consciousness is associated with the cultural contribution of Franz Josef Empire, the darker aspects are often overlooked. As society began to resemble the declining Roman Empire, fundamental values gradually eroded. Seven, many influent individuals at the courts in Vienna not limited to Vienna, began to believe, even though the emperor was hesitant, that the war might be preferable to being invaded by those who were enamored with Marx, Engels, and, as Ross suggested, therefore, by the movements of the gods, as Jung underlined, of the post-Tsar Russia. What interests me are the psychosocial reasons that underlie this 
which are at the core of this lecture. On this regard, Jung looked at the years before World War I, and it's fundamental to look at them. In Wotan, he underlines that, quote, when we look back at the time before 1914, we find ourselves living in a world of events which would have been inconceivable before the war. We were even beginning to regard war between civilized nations as a fable. Thinking that such an absurdity would become less and less possible in our rational, internationally organized world. The fable that you talk about, in my opinion, represent that period which the Bible described as the fat cows. Therefore, it's a time of abundance destined to end what emerges for the time of the lean cows, marking not only economic difficulties, but also social crisis. Therefore, chaos. This relates to what was emphasized earlier in connection to also what Luigi Zoya uh, wrote on a recent paper uh, and about the fact that Russia could serve as therapy for the West. So what I emphasized early could be seen as an earthquake what actually happened at the beginning of the 20th century. And this earthquake uh, that beginning, that started at the beginning of the 20th century also caused another earthquake at the beginning of the 21st centuries. Especially when looking at those that were or are in love with their own word of yesterday and those who were in love or are with the world of tomorrow. Therefore, let me explain. The metaphorical earthquake I refer to is about reset versus movement. Those yearnings for reset do not embrace modernity well, embodying the irony of Carl's Valentine whip. The future used to be better or yesterday, or in the past, the future used to be better. Also translated as before the future used to be better. It's a nostalgic and yet melancholic sentiment. Perhaps within this yes lies putting programmatic agenda to reset the current world in order to revive the world he cherished one that faded away with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the implosion of the Soviet Union, an illusionary ideologized world in which only the future used to be better, because reality is a struggle for the majority of the population. While those wishing for movement were found with a new concept of modernity, a time associated with a certain set of attitudes toward the world the idea of the world as open to transformation by human invention, as Anthony Giddens underlined. On this regard, it is enough to observe the years preceding the First World War in Austria, Germany, and Russia, for example. This illustrates the unsustainability and of an outdated economic, social, and cultural model based solely on the abundance of hedonism of a few social classes. It is in such time, Jung and Zweig agree on this, that the world was starting to be open and interconnected, although it was also losing its spiritual aspect. Analyzing the reasons that brought to World War I, Jung underlines that, quote, in the sphere of religion, we can see in the sphere of religion, we can see at once that some very significant things have been happening. We need feel no surprise that in Russia, the colorful splendor of the Eastern Orthodox Church have been superseded by the movement of the godless. And however, the parable, the low spiritual level of the scientific reaction, it was inevitable that 19th century scientific enlightenment should one day dawn in Russia. Here, Jung is clearly alluding to the movements that will later lead to revolution in Soviet Russia. However, Jung does not frame this turn as a political issue, but rather a spiritual one. 
He asserts that with the loss of spirituality, the movements of the godless, there can be only decay. Jung and Zweig ideas support the consideration that early 20th century Europe has experienced a decline into obscurity as a consequence of the loss of spirituality and the emergence of a world driven by enlightenment and technology. This era gave rise to a decadence marked by hystericized behavior and a pronounced hedonistic and Dionysian undertone. Of course, Nietzsche's description of the Dionysian has nothing to do here. Zweig proves to be insightful on this matter while describing the early 20th century. I believe his look at the period between world wars is not only illuminating, but perhaps even prophetic for our time, although not for his time, as he wrote them retrospectively. Zweig wrote, along the Kufusterdam, or the Kudam, as the Berliners say, the Kudam is the most important street in Berlin, like the Fifth Avenue or the Champs-Élysées. Along the Kudam, adolescents with heavy made-up faces stroll by, wearing tightly chinched waistlines, and they weren't all just sex worker. High school students were always in the lookout for opportunities to earn some money. In the dimly lit corners of certain establishments, you could spot state secretaries and wealthy financiers fondly and shamelessly caressing young drunken sailors. Not even Rome in sustenuous time witnessed orgies quite like the dances where hundreds of men in women's attire and women in men's clothing gay rated under the indul indulgent gaze of the police. With the precipitous collapse of values, a sort of madness size the previously orderly bourgeois classes, young girls boosted about their perversions and being suspected of virginity at the age of 16 was considered a shame in a Berlin school of that era. Everyone wanted to share their adventure and the more bizarre it was, the more interesting. But the most disgusting aspect of this eroticism was its chilling insincerity. Zweig continues, the German orgiastic frenzy fueled by hyperinflation was essentially a feverish mimicry. You could see it in the faces of, of those bourgeois young girls from the good families who would have preferred to wear braids instead of cropped boyish hair and eat apple pie with whipped cream instead of drinking liqueur. It was quite evident that the masses found this state of constant hyper-excitability unbearable. These precarious balancing acts on the tightrope of inflation while everyone longed for a bit of peace, order, and bourgeois security. The Republic was secretly hated, not because it suppressed that unrestrained freedom, but on the contrary, because it let the reins to lose. Anyone who lived through those apocalyptic months and years experienced the bitterness and disgust for so that a backlash, a tremendous reaction would eventually come. In the aforementioned portrayal by Zwei, echoes the sentiment expressed by Putin in an effort to imbue war with higher purpose fighting the decline of Western society and ensuing that it does not affect the values of great Russia. In fact, both in today's Western world and in the 19th Berlin, many people associated their freedom beyond the home option described by Beck and primarily with aesthetic choices. Today, there is a return to that decadent aesthetic proposed by Huizmont, where the ability to expose one body, nipples or undergarments, for example, without restriction is given for granted. 
The most begotten might say that streets have transformed into a burlesque spectacle. Frankly speaking, this is not the real problem for me. Each era has succeeded the previous one in terms of fashion and how much the body is covered or not. The issue lies in getting lost in Dionysian without depth, I believe. The Dionysian does become a mere passing phase to which people in search of meaning and a group to belong to join, only to move on to another group or trend in a few years. This is because in this neo-decadent society, there is no chance for the experience of meditation. As I wrote in my book, Absolute Freedom, Jung, in his essay, Self-Knowledge, claimed that, quote, what I call coming to terms with the unconscious, the alchemists call meditation, and added, citing Bulan, that meditation is an inner talk of one person with another who is invisible as in the vocation of a deity, or communion with oneself or with one's God angel. In the super society, I believe, which is the hyper individualized and hyper liquid one, I propose there is a fresh need for renewed inner talk. And one way of engaging in such is through Jungian psychoanalysis. Jung claimed that modern meditation methods are only for increased concentration and consolidation, consolidating consciousness, but have no significance as regards affecting a synthesis of the personality. On the contrary, their purpose is to shield consciousness from the unconscious and suppress it. That being the case, such methods are of no therapeutic value. Instead, Jung proposed analysis as meditation, although there are relatively few people who have experienced the effects of analysis of the unconscious on themselves, and almost nobody hits on the idea of using the objective hints given by dreams as a theme of meditation. The issue with the Berlin and Vienna of the 20th century, of the early 20th century, described by Zweig and Roth, is precisely that, quote, lacks significance in terms of achieving a synthesis of the personality, Jung. The same can be said for contemporary neo-decadent society. What Zweig and Roth articulated about the early 1900s in relation to the collapse of values even though the Roaring Twenties were often perceived as a period of openness and experimentation, could be illuminating in understanding the situation of the West today. It's worth pondering whether such openness and experimentation, well described by Bauman, are in fact common features in a society that are on the brink of decline or implosion, thus marking a sense of decadence. They may serve as a form of compensation for the fear of death and the end of an era. The last party before war and death. This openness and experimentation may in fact be the initial steps toward decay and decadence, a somewhat hystericized way of living that lacks depth and soul. Now, about war and reset. I strongly believe that the description of the interwar years, 1939, the contemporary era, mirrors the perspective presented by Freud in Civilization and its discontents. In this seminal work, the father of psychoanalysis delved into the human desire to escape the confines of the bourgeois world and its laws and norms in order to unleash the most primal instinct within us. This phenomenon we know initially unfolds in the hinterland of society and especially the human psyche, as depicted by Arthur Schnitzler in one of his most significant work, Traumwolle, Double Dream. Subsequently, it permeates the everyday world, as documented by Zweig, about Berlin's Kudam and by Roth about Vienna circles and its imperial and royal army. However, it is important to remember that the two world wars had different motivations. Zweig underscores that the first world war was 
detach from reality and still serve as an illusion, specifically the dream of a better, fairer, and more peaceful world. Therefore, the nation states, after the initial transformation of the 90s, uh, of the 19th century or the 20th century realized that their vision of the world were divergent and only armed conflict could bring about a reset of the cherished status quo and its universal dissemination. On the other hand, according to Zweig, the Second World War, even larger than the first one, and a spiritual rational, it was a battle to safeguard freedom and moral goodness. In essence, I propose that both world wars were about a reset, aimed at the restoration of a decayed order and a set of values. A reset bridging back, bringing back the world of yesterday against the fear of the world of tomorrow, whatever these could be and mean. I believe that the invasion of Ukraine by Putin Russia as traits from both First and Second World War, it is detached from reality and serve as an illusion, specifically the dream of a better, fairer, and more peaceful world in which Russia is the leader. Secondly, this war as a spiritual rational, it is like Second World War, a battle to safeguard freedom and moral godness of Russia against the deprivation of the West. German historian and journalist Joachim Fest in Il Sogno Distrutto contended that both Nazism and Communism emerged in the early 20th century in response to the challenges posed by bourgeois industrialization and the erosion of traditional values, as explored by Zweig above. And this could suffice to contrast joyous proposal as Russia and Western Europe, although with different methods and timelines, both embark on the journey of industrialization that began in the late 19th century. The difference lies in the fact that in Russia, the ideas of Marx and Engels truly took hold as an antidote to the misdeeds of the royal family. While in the many other countries, notably Germany and Austria, the transition from monarchy to republic after World War I gained momentum in a democratic context. But if both Nazism and communism emerges response to the erosion of traditional values, what does Putin anachronistic and 20th century like war with Ukraine respond to? In light of what we have witnessed, consider for instance, the invasion of Iraq by Bush senior and junior, it becomes clear that modern wars conducted by contemporary empires are not necessarily driven by the highest moral values, the preservation of freedom and the pursuit of peace or the wish for a better future. One can interpret Putin's action as an attempt to rectify and reset Ukraine's adoption of Western values, as I underline in each interview of the book War as Reset. On this issue, Western media frequently emphasize that Putin invaded Ukraine not only to demilitarize and denazify the pro-Western Ukraine, but also to suppress LGBTQ plus movements and rights and to end the queer movement, aligning with Moscow patriarch like Kirill. In fact, an article titled Russia Church Leader Appeared to Blame Gay Pride Parades in War Ukraine, published on the Moscow Time in March 22, highlighting that Patriarch Kirill said the war is about which side of God humanity will be on. In the divide between supporters of gay pride event or Western governments that allow them and their opponents in the Russia-backed Eastern Ukraine. Is Putin, aided by Kirill in conflict with the LGBTQ plus individuals to the same extent that Nazism and communism were in conflict with the queers of the 20th century? It is proven that regimes dislike queerness, at least in the public sphere, while appreciating law and order. The truth is that, as I frequently emphasize throughout the interviews in the book Wars of Reset, Putin's effort is to thwart Ukraine from fully embracing specific European values, such as those advocated by thinkers like Abermas and Derrida, more than deploring the deprivation of the West. Although Putin, like every dictator, cannot tolerate any form of queerness and aims to eliminate it, 
because queerness is seen as the threat to a country and its culture if it gains. Examples are evident at the end of the Roman Empire with Senator Otzil, at the end of the French Empire with Marie Antoinette Bigotry, and uh, at the end of the Austrian Hungarian Empire, where the ruling class would live mostly at night in lust and deprivation that has nothing to do with Nietzsche's Dionysiac and Jung's concept of synthesis of the personality. Is war a remedy for unhappiness when the real enemy is happiness? In the shift from modernity to the contemporary era, the LGBTQ movement and individuals, a present that existed throughout history, of course, have gained a more pervasive and mainstream status. To the point where today in Western society, many consider themselves to be queer or to have some aspect of queer. However, currently, the true significance of queerness often becomes obscure or diluted, especially when it is exploited by a corporation for pro profit. Likewise, in my view, the LGBTQ movements and individuals have consistently played a fundamental role in the advancement and transformation of every society. Nevertheless, challenges arise in the 21st century when authorities struggle to harness and regulate this movement. What was once led by a few individuals has now evolved into a collective of millions of individuals. I want to shift to look at what I call broken queerness, and I hope not to be misunderstood when we're talking about this, which occurs when queerness does not lead to the synthesis of the personality. Therefore, is war a fight to queerness? In an attempt to underscore the importance of queerness in contemporary society, I would like to share a case involving one of my male patients. In my paper titled Patti Stilettos, I discuss about my patient Patti, who identifies as a queer. During our first meeting, Patti expressed a feeling of emptiness and being stuck. It is crucial, therefore, not to confuse queerness with the sense of emptiness or being lost. From our initial encounter where Patty arrived wearing work coveralls, third color nail polish and high heel woman shoes, it was clear that they were aware of having a problem and actively seeking a solution. Not because of the way they were dressed, but because they told me I have a problem. But what exactly was the problem? Patty expressed discomfort in uniform environments and a preference for queer spaces. This preference should be acknowledged and respected. However, is there more to wearing high heels and nail polish? I questioned. I took the opportunity to ask Patty about the meaning of queerness. They replied, experimentation. Then they added, I don't agree with the binary imposition of culture. If I like a pair of women's shoes, I will wear them. Does experimentation devoid of soulful insight amount to nothing more than a superficial aesthetic endeavor, resembling the pursuit of decadence, symbolist and Parnassian, as, as exemplified by Jurika Wisman at the end of the um, 19th century in, in his work Arabois? There's a sense the protagonist of Wisman's book is depicted as a character marred by is eccentricity, seclusion, and physical ailment. He strongly resents the prevailing bourgeois society of the 19th century and embarks on a quest to retreat from it, seeking solace in an idealized artistic realm he constructs for himself. The narrative primarily consists of an extensive catalog detailing the senses, complex aesthetic preferences, reflection on literature, painting, matters of faith, and his heightened sensory experiences. Is it possible that what I've, got, I've described above, experimentation devoid of soulful insight could be a potential outcome or even the end of the queer movement today? A movement emptied of its original meaning and filled with broken individual in search for meaning and a group to belong to? Is the emergence of the broken queer movement a manifestation of a 
historicized and neurotic way of life akin to the protagonist of Wiesmann's novel and reminiscence of the Berlin and Vienna portrayed by Zweig and Roth? Does this narrative mirror the faith of many individuals in Western society, eccentric, isolated, possessing a profound aversion to contemporary society and yearning to retreat from societal responsibility while seeking solace in an idealized artistic realm? In today's Berlin, the epicenter of such a phenomenon is Berlin the epicenter of such a phenomenon just as it was in the 1920s? This question may not hold significance for Patti, my patient. They are primarily theoretical. What truly matters is what Patti conveyed during our initial meeting, a sense of emptiness. This emptiness to which Patti referred during our first session is therefore necessary to them. Not pleasant, but necessary. Patti emptiness allow us to understand that their current situation and how they feel is related to the fact that they have not yet been born. The Patti lives in an embryonic state. Patti, Patti is like Osiris, fragment from a dream, a mummy without a phallus, neither alive nor dead, seeking refuge in the queer war, the only comfortable place right now, a very important place right now. Therefore, Patti must differentiate themselves and have the primary goal of developing their individual personality. To this day, Patti is undifferentiated, but thanks to dream work and the insight from the soul, we can recognize psychosocial indifferentiation and from an aesthetic point of view, maternal pseudo-integration symbolizes by the use of pear color nail polish and eye heels. Here, our aim is not about curing their gender identity or queerness and therefore the need of conformity to society, but about revealing a secret an underground connection that consciously manifests itself in wearing nail polish and eels and unconsciously through this dream. Now I'm reaching the end. Lastly, there's the lesson of COVID-19. Are there parallels between COVID-19 pandemic and war? In early 2020, I wrote that almost overnight, the spreading of COVID pandemic brought profound and lasting changes in the ways we all live and work in our inner and outer states, reshaping radically the forms of our living together. I hoped for a change of paradigm where actually we would go, thanks to the depth, into another sphere of reality. Unfortunately, I was wrong and naive while Michel Hulbeck prediction, the world will be the same, only some worse, was right. Indeed, now believe that with the invasion of Ukraine, we have transitioned from a period I previously referred to as the suspension of certainties to another I would call the end of certainties. These vanishing certainties are deeply connected to what Jung alluded to in his discussion of Wotan, quote. We were even beginning to regard war between civilized nations as a fable, thinking that such an absurdity would become less and less possible in our rational, international, organized world. I propose and still believe that the pandemic, which exposes us to all profound uncertainty, could become an opportunity for change and new beginning, an opportunity to decelerate, to ponder, and to realize that nature wanted us to pass from the outer world to the inner one, from extroversion to introversion, then to the interior and the soul, to be able later to return outside and maintain an inner outer balance. Both the pandemic and the war are to my reckon an opportunity for reset. This reset, as I propose in my previous book, that of moving from a world base of hopes and expectation to a linear world to one where interiority and spirituality, not necessarily religious, returns to be contemplated, so that something new can really begin to sprout, creativity from the soul. And I wonder whether this is an aspect of what Zoya proposed in his article, Russia's Therapy. My call remain and will remain now unheard. My call was and is aimed at remembering that creativity and creative fantasy help fluidity and pluralism, any fluidity rather than individualization and liquidity is fostered, 
there would be a chance to contrast anxiety, depression, suicidality, and the four anomie. Yet, I believe that the origin of this war so anachronistic, so 20th century, can be tracked back to the same reason that Roth character, Choi Niki, used to shout in, us, in his outdoor rallies. Choi Niki, Roth, let's say. This empire, the Austro-Hungarian empire, is destined to decline. As our emperor closes his eyes, we fall into a hundred pieces. The Balkans will be stronger than us. All people will establish their own sordid little states and have the Jews, and even the Jews will appoint a king in Palestine. In Vienna, the stench of sweat from the Democrats is so strong that you can't even stay on the Ringstrasse anymore. Workers wave red flags and no longer want to work. The mayor of Vienna is a drunkard. The priests are with the people and sermons in Czech are delivered in churches. At the book theater, Jewish filth is staged. And to put it mildly every week, Hungarian latrine manufacturer becomes a baron. I warn you, gentlemen, that if we don't act now, it's over. Who lives will see. And then Roth emphasizes that those who listen to him laughed and shrugged it off. They didn't understand him, of course, and that in any case, this man, Choinchi, a deputy in the parliament for years, favored by government and a denigrator of the very parliament he belonged to, was regularly re-elected by his district, defeating all opposing candidates with money, power, surprise, and bribery. So corruption. Today, just as in Roth, era, the above mentioned reason offer little hope for the future. This is, in my opinion, true deprivation of any society, not the one many conservative attribute to the queer community. Conclusion. We as Europeans come of age on the cusp of the 20th and 21st century with hazy recollection of the history of the Berlin Wall and its fall on November 9th, 89, are the, product, are the product of the Europe Erasmus. We are married to German, Spanish, have kids that are born in many, many countries. We as European, while I am aware of the risk to be perceived again as naive and then Michel Olbeck might certainly reveal right again, have to work for individual and collective change, even individuation. We have to work for those ideals described by Roth and Zweig at the beginning of the 20th century, for a true and united Europe of sisters and brothers of whatever gender, sex, origin, as well as ethnicity. In fact, Europe, it is de facto queer. Ultimately, I strongly believe that the pandemic and war beg for a reset, which consists in the ability to ask each other, who am I? How do I want to live? Who are we? How do we want to live? Therefore, paraphrasing Gigerich, it could be said when looking at the word and history that this is it. And that it is the word that contains everything it needs within itself. And that our continuous seeking is our running away from our own fulfillment. In early October, uh, month ago, more or less, I found myself bedridden with COVID once more, as at the beginning of the war in uh, Ukraine, just after I had finished drafting this paper. It struck me as somewhat ironic that I con contracted the virus again right as I completed my work. This time it coincided with media outlets wary of the ongoing Ukrainian-Russian conflict preparing to shift their attention to the Middle East. This shift followed a barbaric and deplorable attack by Hamas on October 7, and Israel disproportionate counterattack. When pondering on such attack, I could not avoid remembering the words that John Bibi wrote me after reading this piece you just heard. He wrote, the attempt to suppress the diverse, the queer, Desire to make the most happiness out of what we have 
is the same energy that wants to spoil what we have with war so that no one can enjoy it. As if we must start again or turn back from the self that knows what's good for itself to a dictated regulation of pleasure so that even more war can seem a remedy for unhappiness when the real enemy all along has been happiness. Can the Israeli-Palestinian conflict be about reset? Perhaps. Palestinian wish for a reset that would enable them to return to their own world of yesterday, specifically to the world before 1947. Israeli wish to find a secure place and refuge and return to the promised land. Until these contrasting hopes and expectations are reconciled, there will be no room for change. Thank you very much, and thank you for bearing with me. Thank you, Stefano. It was a very dense and compelling talk you gave us. Difficult to find some questions. I have one comment. Uh, you mentioned Stefan Zweig, and Stefan Zweig made this, uh, for me, very uh, deep insight when he said uh, the nationalism is the Erzpest, the arch plague of Europe in the 20th century. And through the uh, foundation uh, uh, of the European Union, we overcame that. And I'm afraid to see, and this is what we can see in Ukraine and Russia, that this nationalism is coming back very strongly. And yeah. Um, I'm not sure if nationalism are coming back very strongly. And at least the parties, which are very nationalistic, are so, coming. Strongly. But what I would like to say is that nationalism have always been there. Like, to be frank, guys, anti-Semitism has always been there. But after the Second World War, especially the Germans, but everyone in Europe, was told and taught that to be anti-Semitic is wrong, and it is wrong. This is why right now there is a lot of discussion about anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. So nationalism, anti-nationalism, anti-Semitism, Semitism are always there, but if we repress them, as Jungian <clears throat> says, they might one day come up and destroy why do we have new nationalism? Well, because certain people think that, for example, Europe is not a right thing when united. But it's again about, I guess, politics, money, greed, as I tried to underline in my paper. Any questions from the audience? Or comment, doesn't need to be a question. Well, I'm wondering if the um, nationalism isn't part of our search for identity and the, the fear of losing identity being very strong whenever there is change. So there is a reversion to the mean, which is identifying through the group and a nation state being an obvious group because of the language, nations. So I, I think there's something deeply psychological here that is wrapped up with war and the fear of loss of identity. Absolutely. In fact, in, at least in Europe, nationalism sprouted again in the 90s, yeah, after the wall of the Berlin Wall with confusion. For many, many years of confusion where, where basically everything had to be reinvented. Uh, from an ideological point of view. Uh, I think that's also why there's such a backlash against gender uh, non-conformity, because if you identify as male or female and somebody shows up, <laughs> you know, non-binary, it's not that it, 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 they're the threat to you. It's not that, that uh, they are a threat. They threaten your identity. 
Yeah. Anybody else? I would say it was a very erudite paper, Stefano. Can you repeat uh, a very? A very erudite, very, um, uh, how shall I say, um, intelligent <laughs> and full of um, quotes. And I think um, it would benefit from being read also. Yes, As, of course. Yes. So <laughs> I want to say thank you very much. I really enjoyed it, but I would like to read it. Yes, and I apologize. It's very late here. I've been working with patients since 9 a.m. in the morning, so I think my mouth and my language was not the best. So I apologize for those that had difficulties in following it. Raymond. Yes, um, I'm not a I'm not a psychologist myself, but uh, the talk was incredibly rich, and the thought that came to me is. Could war be seen as essentially the externalization, social externalization of the conflict, be, the inner conflict between the ego and the self? Isn't it? Uh, and I and I shared this question with the more experienced Jungians here. Now I also see my dear friends and colleagues from Argentina, Anna. Deligianis and, and Karim Fleischer. So I say hello to you in these special days in Argentina, but isn't that also what is happening in Argentina, a conflict between the ego and the self or, or the broken ego and the broken self? Jordi. Uh, Stefano, uh, nice to see your face. Look forward to meet you in person sometime, as many of you. Uh, above that, thanks for the courage of choosing the, the topic and having the courage of being public. Uh, sometimes courage is a social virtue, as in is, and going to the some depth. And I make that extensive to the, all the audience and the organizers. Now, uh, I look forward to read your paper with this thing on my hand and to play some feedback. We have an experience of divisive nationalism now in Spain, where I am from. I'm not a, clean, a clinician, but I have some Jungian training. I mean, divan, etc. And where, where tribalism ends or neo-tribalism and nationalism begins, it's something that we better start looking deeper because it has lots of implications. And yeah. I celebrate for being here. I mean, it's a pleasant comment. I'm not a pleaser, but I have to say so. Thank you very much. Jordi, uh, thank you very much. Um, merci, or gracias, as you say over there. Well, in your region, for example, there is a big conflict, right? Again, of who belongs to who. And uh, it's very difficult uh, to bring about the concept of not independence, the 20th century com 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 idea, but the concept of interdependence. Mm -hmm. This is why Europe is working until it's working. Mm -hmm. But many, the nationalists, they want to go back like the British, they want to go back to their own sovereignty. They want to be independent, and they have their right. As I said, I am son of the Erasmus generation. That is this project that shaped my generation in Europe, where basically you were allowed to go to study into another country, learning another languages. Many marriages happened. Many people met people, and it really started our siblinghood in Europe. And... Uh, and it's culture as well. And I did it in Budapest, not in London, Paris, or Barcelona, which were the cool places. I did it in Budapest, and I knew nothing about Budapest. And I was the first Erasmus student going to a post-communist country that became free 10 years earlier. It was really a very important experience for me that I still bring in my heart. 
Yeah. I see your point. Now, we are experimenting now in Spain a type of nationalism which is uh, divisive and the nationalists say in Catalonia or the Spanish nationalists in Madrid doesn't look at equals the people who do not agree with them. They are a lesser species. I mean, the thing is deeper. And uh, what's going on the back of the head is something on my on Monavi, on my understanding, not properly handled by your guilt. Guilt, I mean your your brotherhood, I mean. Mm -hmm. yeah. of, of deep analyst. Myself, I am from the former generation. I am from the Fulbright generation. Which, so is, I, which is even more global. Yeah, I, I am a national, I am a European nationalist. And I've been a I've been a say a Council of Europe civil servant for a couple of years. Thank Again, you. thanks for the thank you very much. I honor the organizers of that. More of that. Thank you. Thank you that should be a beginning. I mean, uh, talking warfare, combat, courage. Uh, if you want classical man or nor, uh, manliness, we should go beyond Hillman. Yeah. 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 We of should go. Yeah. And thank you very much. Thank you, Jordi. It's nice sometimes to get some good words instead only of some nasty comments that pick up on a word and try to crash you, right? Thank you, Jordi. I am preparing to become an elder, a proper elder. <laughs> <laughs> I think what you did, uh, Stefano, is what is touching, uh, that you surpassed the nationalistic stance. I myself feel not... I'm German by birth, but I'm not feel German anymore. I feel European, and, and listening to your talk brought that reality to me, and this is why I'm thanking you for that talk. But Bernard, you and I started this with Paul four years ago. In January will be the fifth year, so it will be our anniversary, five years of Psychosocial Wednesday. And we all remember we started this at the beginning of the pandemic, and it was something new and innovative. It still goes on, it's amazing. And look at us, me, an Italian who lives in Germany, who was married to a Spanish, who has a German partner, and kids that were born in Spain and Germany. Then we have Jordi from Spain, you from Germany. We have Betty Sue from the United States, Anna, from Argentina, Shirley, I don't know, I think you are from the US. And we can go on and go on and go on. And the audience here is really international. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm very happy that we continue to do this for the international Jungian community mm -hmm. uh, beyond belonging to this country, to this society. And we try to bring, and we'll continue bringing innovative thoughts and uh, to dare to say what somewhere else is not possible to say, right? Mm -hmm. That's the last closing remark, I guess. Well, I don't know. I, I wish the Argentinian to say something, but they are <laughs> shy and worried, right? Yeah, I would like to hear, yes, I would like to hear the, their stance on, on their new president. Well, maybe <sighs> it's... You're welcome, Anna. Karin, ahora te vemos. ¿Estás lista para decirnos algo? Anda, por favor. No. Bueno, os digo yo algo. Os queremos mucho. Estamos ahí con el corazón. Y a ver, cruzamos dedos. Gracias, Stefano. Thanks. And the only thing that I can say that it, it's so much feelings at this at this time going on that I think for me at least and I, for other people also there is not yet a time to say much about it. Just to for me in particular that I am very sad 
I'm worried. Uh, it's hard to understand. Um, yeah, there are so many feelings at this moment. Uh, for those that are not up to date, the bad news is that the worst candidate ever, you know, I'm always direct, the worst candidate, candidate ever, worse than Trump or Berlusconi or Orban, was elected as president of Argentina. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not going to be nice. It's really, it's really even worse than Kirchner and, and, and his wife. Yes, because uh, yeah. with a, with a other with Kirchner uh, was a democracy. It's not a very good democracy, but uh, we prefer democracy instead of this authoritarian uh, of Milley. Also, the vice president uh, said that uh, Argentinian needs a tyranny, a yeah. tyranny. But listen, this, now we have to bring in, pity Tom is not here, but really cultural complexes. I mean, you, Anna, are Greek. Uh, yes. I don't know, I think you are German from origins, but every Argentinian has a lot of Italian. Yes, we are why, an immigrant. Why we Italian are so good in choosing the wrong? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and keep doing it, and keep doing it, right? Yes. Yeah, it's a very difficult situation. Um, the the mayor people uh, needs a change, but this change is a crazy change. Yeah. It's yeah, very yeah. yes, it's very very difficult. But perhaps it goes in line with my idea of reset, not war, but a retrograde, like in uh, in astrology. Right, um, where to change something, we really have to destroy everything. As First World War and Second World War were for Europe, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. progress. But now again, this progress is is threatened. Mm -hmm. And now looking back, the Kirchner don't look so bad. They were mm -hmm. corrupt. But at least they were democrats. I mean, uh, yeah, at least yeah. me saying but, this is but, a blast. Yes, yeah, but, but yeah. for me, I think that the corruption in politics, in, at least in Argentina, are from the beginning. <laughs> so you have to go back to the yes. 19, to the ancient Rome. To, yeah, eighteen hundred. So the the corruption was there from the beginning. So yeah. there is no one political par party that that is free from that. So then it became a practice, I think. And there is a lot that it needs to be changed. Yeah. But the change yeah. that is coming, I think it will bring a lot of pain. Yeah. Uh, and they are, as Anna said, the vice president well, comes from a military family and, and she's in total denial, denial of, the, of the dictatorship. So she's calling almost to go back to that. So that's very sad because I think that one thing that happened in Argentina and we became also known to the world was because of the politics in terms of human rights. And I think that was a good thing we have done. And yeah. uh, Kirchner, uh, during the government of Kirchner, that was, that was done. Now there were many changes and they were, the, the, those people were judged because of crimes against humanity, and that was done, and it's still going on. So it's the first time, well, that was with Menem, one, one, in one moment that stopped, but then it came back with Kirchner, and now again is under threat, that that will stop again, and then so I think there is something also about collective memory that at least for me brings a question, what happened with our collective memory? What happened in those cases? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you, yes, Karin, yes. you are an expert on this. Your work is amazing. Sorry, Anna, I interrupted you. 
Yes. No, no, it, it, that's uh, Karin said about the rights that you win in the last decades. And with this new government, we come back. And this is incredible. Yeah. About the diversity, about the gender, the abortion, something. Mm -hmm. It's very, very difficult. But I think the world is a bit like that. <laughs> I yeah. think yes. it's about all, humanity. All the way. Yeah. yeah. There is a general retrograde. And in, and in Latin America, this is happening a lot, that polarization mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And th this was the idea behind the European Union, you know, to try to create a, sta a stable, uh, a stable uh, Europe from different point of view and interconnection, interdependence. But nationalism only see what I lost, my little garden, you know, while I think the benefits of a stable and united Europe, as Habermas uh, Derrida underlines, is a great thing from everyone, um, but it's very difficult and it needs many, many years so that many more people understand it, not only those, because those that travel around with the Erasmus are a small portion of the big nation, like, for example, Germany, Italy, Spain, England. And the fact that those that voted for Brexit are coming from the countryside and not from the urban cities and are over 60 is very important. I think we have time, uh, Bernard, for one more question or one more comment. So we have North America, South America, Europe. Asia, Europe, Latin America, Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America. They are sleeping, unfortunately. It's too late for them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. And again, the next talk. The December 13th. September, uh, December 13th. See you then. Thank you, bye Stefano. Bye. All Ciao. the best. Thank you. Good night. Bye.